Hi, I'm Randy Tritel from the Federal Trade Commission, and I'm here today to talk with Terry Calvani, who will share his insights based on his distinguished and interesting career as an antitrust lawyer, professor, and enforcement official. Terry, why don't we get started by telling us something about your personal background. Okay. I was born in Carlsbad, New Mexico in 1947, educated at the University of New Mexico, and then went to law school at Cornell in upstate New York. Uh, after that, I went into private practice at the Pillsbury Firm in San Francisco. What was it that drew you to the law? Um, I wish I had a noble answer to the question, but I think, frankly, I just wasn't sure what else I could do. And law school was available. I applied and got in. And once you had settled on law, what is it that brought you to the field of antitrust? Again, I wish I had a noble answer, but I got a good grade in antitrust and thought I must know something about it. So when I interviewed with the firm and they asked me what I wanted to do, I said, and I trust. And I've been with it ever since. And where has it taken you throughout your career? Well, I started, as I indicated a moment ago, uh, at the Pillsbury firm, where I practiced uh, for a few years. And then I took a teaching position at Vanderbilt University, where I taught antitrust law for about 10 years. And then President Reagan nominated me to a position uh, on the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. I served one term from 1983 to 1990. Uh, and then, after that, I returned to private practice, again with the Pillsbury firm, until the year 2002. At that point, uh, the Irish government offered me a position as a member of the Irish Competition Authority, a member of its board of directors, uh, where I had the criminal investigations portfolio. And I did that until 2005, uh, when I returned to the United States and uh, joined Freshfields, Brookhouse, Derringer in their Washington office where I am today. I guess you could say I have not been able to hold down a job for very long at all. So your career's taken you through academia, private practice, government. What have you found rewarding about each of those experiences? Well, I think they're all different. Uh, in the sense that teaching is quite different from practicing law, uh, and that's quite different from running a law enforcement agency. But the common thread through all of them was the focus on antitrust. And I think it was sort of the synergy of all three together that's made them even more interesting than it would have been if I'd stayed with one career path uh, throughout the entire time. Well, looking back on your private practice experience, what have you found most interesting, interesting cases or issues you've worked with? Well, I guess my private practice in antitrust has been a bit like my life in general, and that's uh, sort of mixed up and varied. Uh, I've tried to have a mixture of uh, government cases, both uh, civil investigations, principally in the merger area, uh, grand jury defense work, uh, criminal work that is, uh, and then maybe a third of it devoted to defense of private treble damage actions. So a mix of antitrust work. Mm -hmm. Any particular cases that stand out as formative or particularly interesting? Well, I was, I was lucky to have participated in a lot of very big cases. I did the largest bank merger in the world at its time. I did the largest telecommunications merger in the world at its time. Uh, and then just prior to going to uh, Ireland, uh, I did the Chevron Texaco deal. Those large uh, international transactions, I suppose, were maybe the most challenging and certainly the most interesting. And has your practice focused on government review or private litigation? Again, I think a mixture. Um, about about two-thirds of it uh, government, one half of that civil, one half of that criminal, uh, and the remainder uh, private trouble damage defense work. And as between counseling and litigation? Again, again, a mix. Uh, sort of the whole story of my <laughs> life, a mix. <laughs> Uh, do you have a, a fondest professional memory? I guess I've got a lot. I mean, the one thing that sort of sticks out is in 1974, when I was an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, Lou Ingman, who was, I think, chairman of the Federal Trade Commission at the time, uh, came to town. It was my job to be his, uh, uh, his host and his escort and bag carrier. And I spent, I don't know how much time preparing for the visit of the of the great uh, chairman of the Federal Trade Commission and uh, had a great time doing that. And then it was, gosh, I forget how many years later, maybe 12 years later, when uh, I was uh, acting chairman of the commission and Lou England took me to dinner with his wife, Pat. And I thought, gee, that's kind of strange. Uh, in 12 years, this, this transition uh, 
I thought that was fun. I remember that. And and on the other side of the coin, do you do you have a worst professional memory? Yeah, I, I have uh, probably several of those too. But the one that sticks out in my mind was the battle that I got into uh, with then Chairman Dingle uh, uh, at the House of Representatives. Uh, you may recall that <clears throat> there was a uh, power struggle between two Democratic chairmen in the House of Representatives, uh, Chairman Thomas and Chairman Dingell, uh, over the jurisdiction of their committees. And Dingell believed, wrongly as it turns out, uh, that I had some documents that reflected the fact that, or his suspicion that the agency had sided uh, with Chairman Thomas in the struggle. Uh, and so he asked for the production of the files of my attorney advisor on a particular matter, and I refused. I took the view that my attorney advisors were my attorneys and that I couldn't ask them to give me unvarnished assessment, analysis of cases if they thought Congress was going to be looking over their shoulder. They'd be writing uh, for the public as opposed uh, to me, for me. And so I refused to produce them. He subpoenaed them. Uh, I hired counsel and we, we did this minuet for a while. Uh, and the end of the story, as you probably recall, is that I lost uh, and ultimately had to produce the documents to the House of Representatives, which of course was a huge boring event because there was nothing in the documents <laughs> of interest to anybody. But, but I lost that one and I lost it in a pretty public way. Mm -hmm. well, well, how did you find it coming into government after years spent in academia and private practice, sometimes as a critic of the government process? How did it square with what you expected? Well, I, I, I'd make two comments. I mean, first, it was an incredibly valuable experience for me uh, to uh, be able to compare and contrast the, the private sector and uh, how government operates. Uh, and I think it made me a better public servant. I think that I was able to bring to my public service career uh, insights as to how the private sector operates. And I think on return to the private sector, I was a better lawyer because I had an understanding of, of how government operates. So it was a good experience for me in that way. But perhaps more importantly, I think I learned a great deal of respect for the professional men and women uh, that serve in our government, particularly the agencies that I've had the pleasure to work for or work in. And uh, that's been a valuable experience too, valuable teaching. Well, speaking of valuable teaching, is there anybody in your life who you regard as a mentor who's had a particularly strong influence on your professional development? You know, that, that, that would be a very large number of people that, uh, that I'd have to include in that list. I'm hesitant to even make a stab at it because uh, I'm doubtless going to leave out lots of folks. But I guess Bob Summers at Cornell Law School uh, was perhaps a model for me in my teaching career, taught me to think critically. Uh, Bill Edland at the Pillsbury Firm, for whom I worked in starting back in the early 1970s, I think uh, started me out in how to be a good lawyer. Uh, and probably on the antitrust bar, Jim Rill has been a, uh, a strong mentor over the years. But, but there'd be a lot of others too. And any particular insights or lessons that you gain from these mentors? Oh gosh, again, a very long list. I mean, I think the most valuable professional lesson that I learned, and fortunately I think I learned it early on, was surround yourself with very bright, capable people, more capable and brighter than you are, and, and uh, it'll make you look good and you'll accomplish your job uh, uh, better by having you know, the people that are really outstanding around you. Well, Terry, how, how would you say the practice of antitrust law has changed over the course of your career? It's changed in two ways, uh, one positive and one negative. Uh, on the positive side, uh, antitrust law has become much more rational. Uh, today there are sound economic underpinnings uh, for uh, antitrust analysis that didn't exist when I went to law school. Uh, that has made uh, the discipline itself, the subject itself, uh, I think more rational. Uh, more productive uh, and more consistent uh, with consumer welfare, uh, broadly defined. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another change that's, that's not so positive is the high cost of doing antitrust work. I mean, it's just got more and more expensive over the years, 
and I'm concerned about the costs that are imposed upon clients uh, in the defense of antitrust trouble damage actions, but also in appearances before uh, the enforcement agencies, uh, particularly in some merger matters. I mean, today, um, I think we run a risk of deterring uh, smaller transactions from ever taking place because the legal cost associated with the review uh, many times impairs the value of the entire transaction. So on the positive side, economics. On the negative side, I worry about uh, the cost imposed upon uh, uh, on the clients, but ultimately on the public. Well, looking at the substantive changes that you identified, to what would you attribute them, looking at the influences of the academy, the courts, the agencies, the Congress? Well, I, I, think, I think you've, in a sense, um, uh, previewed my answer because uh, I'd look to the academy first. If you, if you uh, examine the changes in antitrust law uh, here in the United States, but for that matter elsewhere, uh, I think the genesis for it all is in the academy. Uh, professors like Aaron Director, for example, at Chicago and later at Stanford, um, uh, thought critically about competition law, about antitrust. Uh, they imparted that critical thinking to their students. Their students matured, uh, took positions of prominence at the bar, uh, in the judiciary, uh, at the federal agencies, uh, and what was academic thinking became public policy. So I'd, I'd say the beginnings uh, were in the universities, and over time, uh, the, the, those teachings have moved from uh, the musings of professors into public policy. How durable would you say those changes are? There would probably be some who say that antitrust has coalesced into a bipartisan fundamental consensus. Are we at the end of antitrust history? Well. Um, I can answer the first part of it by saying that um, there clearly is uh, a, a, a consensus, I think, I think a bar bipartisan consensus uh, on the canon of antitrust. I mean, clearly there are differences, there will always be differences between administrations, but those differences are largely at the margin. There truly is a consensus. Um, now, are, are we at the end of the road? Uh, have we reached perfection? Uh, I think the answer to that is obviously no. Uh, antitrust is at its bottom, applied industrial organization economics. Uh, economics is not static, it's a dynamic discipline. Uh, there will be changes. Uh, what we think today, uh, a couple of generations later, may look silly and foolish. Uh, precisely where all this goes, I don't know, but the one thing I am certain of, we're not at the end of the road and there will continue to be changes. But the changes that you envision would then be based on new economic learning. How confident are you in, in that assumption rather than antitrust could go back to being based on other considerations? Well, I'm pretty confident about that. I mean, um, that's like saying how confident are you that uh, uh, preparing breakfast will remain a, a part of cooking. Uh, I, I, think, I think it will be uh, because antitrust is, at bottom, applied economics. Uh, and um, uh, to change the underlying predicate of antitrust, I think, would be to change the, the discipline itself. So I'm, I'm pretty confident economics is going to remain at the core, uh, precisely where economics takes us. Uh, as to that, uh, my crystal ball is, is not at all uh, clear. So, so you don't see populism coming back as the underlying, the underlying rationale of antitrust policy? I, I think there'll be ebbs and flows. Uh, uh, populism or populist antitrust uh, uh, has, has not ended. Uh, there's legislation currently pending on the Hill that really has populism as its underlying uh, predicate. Um, so that's, that's not at an end, and, and we'll see increases and decreases over time. But I don't think we'll go back to the good old days of, of Brown Shoe and its progeny where populism was really at the centerpiece of, uh, of antitrust public policy. I think those days are gone, hopefully forever. Well, looking ahead to how antitrust law might develop, what do you see as the greatest potential pitfall? Uh, I, 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 probably 
a good number. Uh, one of them that I, I'm concerned on, I don't want to just go back and reiterate what I said a, a moment ago, is the increasing cost of American litigation uh, and the increasing cost of uh, agency reviews. Uh, and I, I'm worried about where that's taking us. I mean, the, what it cost uh, to do an HSR filing uh, 20 years ago, including a second request, and what it costs today are quite different, even when you adjust uh, for inflation. So uh, using constant dollars, I'm convinced that the process has gotten very expensive. Terry, it seems that in the last couple of terms in particular, the Supreme Court has showed an increased interest in the antitrust field. What would you attribute that to, and what do you think it portends? I don't want to make too much out of it. I mean, I think antitrust is uh, um, of greater interest to the population generally uh, than it was uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, if that's true, then it's not surprising that we see more antitrust cases on the court's docket. Um, now, precisely why the Supreme Court takes the cases that it does uh, as uh, that's a question that I'm ill prepared to answer. I mean, one might ask uh, why the court's been fascinated with the Robinson Patman Act over its history. Probably more Robinson Patman Act Supreme Court cases um, than there are uh, in any other area, and uh, th th that that remains a mystery to me. So I guess that part of the question I, I have got to confess ignorance. Terry, you've had perhaps a unique experience in serving as a commissioner, both in the United States and, and abroad. What differences do you see in the way that antitrust is practiced and, and enforced outside the United States? Clearly, there is a convergence uh, throughout the world uh, as to antitrust policy. Uh, we're seeing um, antitrust look substantively more and more alike, uh, whether we're looking to Europe or the United States, or Latin America, or Asia. There's clearly a convergence taking place. Maybe a good example is the, the work that you did uh, for the uh, uh, International Competition Network, uh, where we've seen a, really a convergence in merger process and the way that agencies around the globe uh, analyze merger transactions. So we're seeing, seeing convergence. Um, by the same token, uh, we oftentimes, I think, ignore the differences that exist in process. So while the substance of the law remains very much the same, the way the law is implemented is, is really, uh, remains, uh, there remain substantial differences. Well, let's go back a step. When you started practicing, there were probably only a handful of jurisdictions that had, had an antitrust law, and even fewer that really enforced them, whereas today we see almost 100 countries that have an antitrust law. Is this a good development? Well, I, I think it is a good development, but it also has, um, it also has cost, and we need to be aware of both of them. Uh, it's, it's a good development to have competition uh, policies in place in countries around the globe because it's good for their consumers, it's good for their citizens. Uh, we ought to applaud that. Uh, the danger is uh, an absence of coordination among the enforcement agencies where you have dramatic duplication, triplication, I don't know what the words would be after that, of costs. For example, uh, before I took my position with the Irish government, I did an international merger transaction. We were reviewed by uh, the U.S. authorities, the EU, and, and I think 25 other jurisdictions, each conducting its own independent investigation. I'm not suggesting that that was wrong. I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that, that there was uh, some fatal flaw with that. But we need to be careful uh, that we don't create a monster where the cost of doing international transactions is become so incredibly high that people can't do them. Do you see any similar risk on the domestic side of multiple enforcement? Uh, yes. Uh, not, not surprisingly, in light of things that I've said before, uh, I think that the U.S. has a crazy quilt of competition law enforcement. Uh, we have the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, and then 50 states' attorneys general. In the transaction that I referenced a moment ago, I believe that we had some 15 different state attorneys general investigating the very same transaction and doing so independently. 
Uh, that's not sound public policy. Even within the European Union, where you've got the Commission and member states, and where member states also have their own enforcement agencies and their own laws, there is at least a consensus of how cases ought to be allocated between the member states and the European Union. We don't have that in the United States, and we should have. On the international side, you've identified a process concern, but what about on the substantive side, if many of those agencies haven't undergone the conversion to economics that we've seen in the United States? Well, uh, and they haven't, let's be frank. Uh, but as economics has become more and more a powerful tool for antitrust analysis in the United States, so too it's taking hold elsewhere. Now, it hasn't done so with, at the same speed. Uh, for example, at the European Commission in Brussels, uh, economics uh, has played less of a role there than it has in the United States. But economics has come to Brussels. It's come late, but it's come, and we are beginning to see the impact of greater economic sophistication, greater economic analysis in the application of competition policy in Europe and elsewhere. So um, uh, uh, it's, it's not only on the horizon, it's there. If you were to ask me why has it taken a longer period of time, I think that a reason may well be the revolving door that exists in the United States, but has existed at least to date uh, much less prominently in Europe and elsewhere. In the US, competition policy has been fertilized in a way by having academics come into uh, the agencies, agency people go into private practice, uh, public servants go into private practice. Uh, um, uh, this, this sort of revolving door between the academy, private practice, and government service has, has brought new people and new ideas into the public service in a way that we haven't seen in Europe. And, one, and some of those new ideas uh, have involved uh, the application of economics to antitrust. So that's a good practice that you see as a potentially good export from the United States elsewhere. Are there others that you see? And conversely, are there lessons that you think we in the United States can learn from the experience of other antitrust systems? Um, well, on the, on the latter part, yes. I mean, I think, uh, I think clearly we in the United States don't have it all right, uh, and there, there are lessons uh, uh, that we can learn. Um, I think one, one, of the, one of the ones that's most necessary is to think about how we allocate antitrust jurisdiction in the United States. I touched on that just a moment ago. Uh, the Europeans, with the so-called modernization, with Regulation 1 of 2003, reached a consensus as to how jurisdiction ought to be shared between the member states uh, and the Commission. Uh, and we've made no progress that I can see uh, in doing something similar between our federal government agencies, our federal agencies, and our state agencies, where everything remains run amok. Well, looking at the international landscape then, as between the pessimists who see this as a cascading series of burdens and conflicts, or optimists who think antitrust can help bring benefits to economies and see a trend toward convergence, where would you see yourself? I'm on the optimistic side. Um, I think that uh, we, we are making progress. The, the ICN work in mergers is a great example of that. Uh, we're doing a um, I think internationally a better job than we've done before. Um, that's, but that's not to say that it's time to sit back and say, oh gee, everything's perfect, we don't need to continue. The work of the ICN uh, remains important, remains vital, uh, because we've had some real uh, successes in merger law. doesn't mean that, uh, that it's time to uh, rest on our laurels. And thankfully, I think that view is shared by, by most. OK, well, moving away from the international area, Terry, is there someone who you regard as the best antitrust lawyer? I'm not going to go there. Uh, that would be, uh, be very thin ice on which to, to skate. There are, there are lots. The American bar has been blessed. The international bar has been blessed with uh, uh, very fine practitioners. Uh, uh, with whom uh, it's, it's been my pleasure, many of whom, to, to work over the years. Uh, uh, as I think back on, on my career, I mean, I guess if I had to identify the, 
most exciting oral argument I ever saw would be uh, Fred Rowe's argument in the General Motors case before the commission, which uh, ought to have been filmed because it was it was masterful. But but uh, uh, Fred would have a, a long list of uh, compatriots if I tried to uh, single out or focus on uh, the best, the best of the best. It's a big group. Well, are there any antitrust books that you think are the best? Um, a, a set of volumes that I think has been incredibly important uh, are the uh, ABA Antitrust Law Development Set. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been incredibly useful, and its utility um, has given it, I think, a great deal of value. I mean, it is basically a restatement of the law. I'm not going to say that it's any more than that. Um, but it would be a very important book. Um, I, other books that I think have been very important also uh, would be those by Dick Posner, uh, Bob Bork, and the late uh, Phil Arita. Uh, their works, I think, ought to be on the bookshelf of any serious uh, competition lawyer or policymaker. Okay, well, you mentioned the ABA antitrust sections, antitrust law developments book. You've been very involved in this section. How did that come about? Uh, pretty much by accident, like the rest of my career. It seemed like a good idea and it might be fun. Uh, and uh, I think I became a subcommittee chairman in maybe 1974, something like that. And have you found the experience beneficial in the section? Yeah. I mean, the section, I, I, at times I've been very active and at times not active at all. Uh, but yes, looking back on it, it's been a positive experience. Terry, any lessons from your career that you can share? Most important lessons or experiences you've had? Oh, well, I, I, I think um, one lesson that I learned very early on, and it's one that young lawyers at least ought to learn early, and that is uh, treat your support staff very nicely because they are, uh, they'll help make you or, or destroy you. And, uh, uh, so I guess that's an important one that sometimes doesn't make its its way into the books. Uh, that would be a good one, uh, and uh, maybe all of us uh, need to be reminded from time to time that a good dose of humility uh, never hurts anyone. Good. Well, any last words of wisdom, especially for young budding lawyers? Well, I, uh, I I've enjoyed my career. I wouldn't uh, suggest that anybody. Uh, be as pathetic as I've been uh, moving from here and there, but it's, I, I encourage people to think about um, you know, getting out of whatever they're doing and doing something different for a while. I've had a lot of fun doing it. Good. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.